Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Good to see everyone. I'm going to throw this up real quick here. Mm -hmm. All right. OK, so like Santani said, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to part two our, of our event series, uh, Hearing the World. Uh, and for those of you guys who join us on Wednesday, welcome back. Um, we have a cool second session planned and we're excited to have you all here today. Uh, I'm Audrey, a postdoctoral fellow at Smith Kettlewell Eye Research Institute. And Santani, who was speaking earlier, is a scientist from Smith Kettlewell. Um, just like last time, uh, before getting started, we just wanted to go over some ground rules just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, so first, if at any point you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. We'll either answer them in the chat or uh, at certain points in the session, uh, we'll read, if we have time, we'll read questions out loud and discuss them. Uh, and second, uh, we ask uh, that you all turn off your mic or mute yourselves. Uh, we have some sounds and videos. Uh, we want everyone to be able to hear without um, any distractions. Okay, so let's move all on right. to the next slide. And um, of course, I forgot one thing, which is what we practiced before, which is to <laughs> make sure I'm sharing my audio. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Are we back on here? Yes. All right. Uh, we are, but I think we're actually seeing your oh, presenter seeing? view. Yeah. All right. Classy. Uh huh. Um, one second. Not to... All right. So seamless. All right. Should third be seeing. The charm. Yes. Yeah. Are we charmed? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Yes. Third time's a charm. Okay. Uh, so you guys can recognize me on the left there. Um, I like I mentioned, I'm a postdoctoral fellow, which just mean which just means that I'm a scientist still getting some training. Um, for example, at Smith Kettlewell, I'm getting some training on different techniques to study brain development. Um, and actually by working with Santani, I'm also uh, learning about auditory development, which we're gonna maybe touch on a bit again today, um, which is basically how our ability to hear and understand sound changes as uh, we grow up. So Santani, do you wanna yeah. talk a bit more about yourself and your research? <laughs> yeah, and um, I am an associate scientist, which is basically the next thing that Audrey's gonna be. Um, and I oh. was a post doctor <laughs> yeah, pretty, soon, pretty soon, Audrey. Uh, <laughs> Until pretty recently, I was a postdoc myself. Um, this, uh, I, I studied um, sound and, and touch uh, mostly in uh, blind people. This is kind of my area of interest, but I've taken a general interest in how sound works and how it works in the brain and, and how we use it to, um, to move around and understand the world around us. And as, as you know, it is especially important you know, when you can't see, right? It becomes a much bigger part of your world. Um, so Audrey brings her expertise in development, which means how things change over the lifespan from childhood, mm -hmm. from birth to childhood to adulthood. And that is something that I'm less familiar with. And this project you can see kind of combines our, our backgrounds. And that's why we're here uh, talking to you about it. Yes. <laughs> so um, just real quick, we're going to throw up a poll here. Um, because this is a part two, you know, we want to know who watched the prequel. And you know, it is not necessary to have seen that to get what we're doing here, right? Um, mm -hmm. We'll cover pretty much everything in general that we did last time a little more quickly, and then and then carry it forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, actually, pretty decent distribution. Hello, yeah. uh, the five of you from last time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so let's uh, let's see. I'm going to close this window for myself. So there's a little over half of you here now um, joined us last time. Um, so we're just going to do a quick recap, right? Uh, I've been watching this whole series. And um, last time we covered sort of four, three or four main points. And they're, they're very basic. So what what is sound? How do we sense it? So sound is something in the world. And then um, how we pick it up in certain ways with our ears and our brains and how we use that information. What does it tell us about the world around us? And we're going to carry that forward a little bit. Um, how do we, you know, we're telling you a bunch of facts here. 
how do we actually find these things out? This is a little bit about the practice of science. So how do we ask and answer some of these questions? Um, so this is just a, a you know, summary of last time. Sound is energy waves moving through vibrating particles. And this is just an illustration here, these little black dots. Usually, you know, when we are hearing sound, um, it's through air. So these little black dots that are moving around represent air. But of course, anyone who's been in a pool, we know we can hear underwater. This could be water. It could be particles of something solid. If you put your ear to the ground, you can um, hear rumbling. In fact, sound travels much faster through solid things. So this is a, when we say particles, we kind of mean, you know, any bits that can transmit vibrations. So it's not the particles themselves that travel forward, it's the waves, right? It's these, um, these patterns of compression, which is just squish, squishing and the opposite stretching. This, is, this pattern is what travels forward. And so we write it, you know, we kind of write sound down like this with, in these waves. But of course, real sounds are very complicated. They don't look this clean most of the time. Um, they are made of many, many different uh, parts of these, uh, these simple waves, right? So some of them are um, higher pitched and you can see that by them being squished together. And then if, if, this wave, if this cartoon wave was taller, it would be louder. And so all these little pieces, they add up and a, and a real sound um, looks something like this, right? Uh, it's very sort of messy and complicated and has um, sort of small quiet parts and then big spikes and so on. But it's, it all is just a sum of many of these parts. So this is a real sound. Um, there's another way that we can uh, look at it and you don't have to worry about what it all means, but this is just a way that we'll show it to you here. So the same sound that you see up here is, is also shown this way. So you can kind of see how some of the patterns look similar. And so um, for those of us who, you know, want to remember or weren't here last time, this is a sound. So, so you're going to hear it and maybe you can follow um, what the, you know, you can follow the pattern as, as you hear it. And it's a, one of the most famous sounds in the last 50 years. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. So, you know, audio quality hopefully has advanced in the last 50 years. But uh, this is the general idea. And so we're going to show you sounds that look like this. And we just want, want to make sure we're all on the same page about that. But what you should remember is that all these complicated sounds, they're just lots of these very simple ones added up. OK, so this is the basics of what sound is in the world. Um, excuse me. And uh, so here is here's us, right? Um, and here's the sound in the background. And so what do we do with those vibrations? We're gonna zoom in here. We got a little snail looking thing here. This is the cochlea. We have the eardrum, which you know we're all supposed to protect by not sticking uh, pencils or Q-tips in. And then we have the auditory nerve and this is just cut off. Of course, the auditory nerve continues for quite a bit, but we'll get there in a second. So let's, let's focus on this zoom a little bit. Um, here we go, just move that over there and let's, zoom in on part of this here, right? Okay. And what I showed you earlier about the sounds, and this is a little more detail than we got last time, but it's the same idea. So this complicated, messy thing, that's what the eardrum actually gets. It just uh, jiggles in this particular way to, to give you this very complicated pattern. Then it passes through this whole system. And what eventually comes out is a brain signal that has split this up this is a very neat trick that the brain does, uh, or that the, that the ear does here, the inner ear. It splits this messy thing up into many small, simple um, you know, pieces. And these are just sort of two ways of looking at it in the same way. So the auditory nerve give, gives the brain these pieces. It doesn't give it the whole messy, complicated thing. It gives the brain these pieces, different uh, frequencies and intensities and patterns over time. Um, so. Here's a very simple, you know, we're kind of zooming out here. This is an arrow, a bunch of, a, a few stops happen here along the way. Um, you know, we're gonna skip over that part, but all this happens and, and it, you know, it ends up being delivered to the brain through the, this 
shell of the brain called the cortex right about here. And this is a side view. So for those of you who um, were not here last time, this is basically if you, know, you sort of put your fingertips above your ears and sort of push inward, you're pointing right at the temporal cortex here, the primary auditory cortex. All right, so it starts out as vibrations, ends up as brain signals that carry the, um, that have already split the sound into pieces. So let's see what that actually looks like, right? Um, this is some, this is a little movie from an experiment that I've worked on with some uh, coworkers. And we're doing this in very slow motion. Each of these numbers is one thousandth of a second, right? So we're seeing this uh, many times slower than normal. But you can see here in this view, it starts out on the sides right about here, but the signal spreads, right? The signal spreads depending on what is in the sound, what we are supposed to do with it if we're trying to recognize a voice or to, uh, tell a, a human from an animal or recognize a motorcycle from, you know, like a lawnmower or something like that. Um, it, this is an overall pattern. It goes all kinds of places in the brain, but this is, it happens very fast, right? You can see that we're at less than half a second. So um, we're, once that number that you see reaches 500, that is half of one second. And so we're, this is a really, uh, you know, slow motion view of, of what happens in the brain when we listen to a sound. And in this particular experiment, all this stuff is happening while the sound is still playing, right? So we, we hear a sound, we don't wait until it's done to then start processing it. It, it all happens kind of on the fly. And this is one of many neat tricks that the brain does that um, we are still all figuring out how to do and that is hard to, hard to understand and then you know, apply for things like um, phones or radios or uh, any kind of uh, uh, doing this artificially with computers is hard, right? We're all on Zoom the last six months. Um, you, can, you know that it's hard to talk and hear at the same time. The brain does that in parallel. Okay, so, um, so that's, that's a brief overview of the road from vibrations in the air to signals in the brain. So what use is all that? So let's figure out. Oh, sorry, one, one second. Um, sorry, Santani. Um, yes. Before moving on, because I think um, this is sort of the last part where we're, when we're going to be talking about the brain, I think it's a good time to answer some questions yes, that people have yeah, asked. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's two questions. Um, the first one is, so last session, a lot of people were talking about, well, what happens if your ears are damaged and how that affects yeah. your hearing? So like one question that I think is important that we, we didn't get a chance to talk about in part one, but maybe we can talk a bit about it today is, well, what happens if like your ears are okay, but um, that part of the brain that is allowing us to hear and process right. sounds, um, that part gets damaged. Like what, what happens in, in, in that case? Yeah, that's right. Uh, um, that's a great reminder. So, so uh, if you remember last time or if you didn't, there were quite a bit, you know, quite a few questions about, you know, can you damage your eardrum and, um, or maybe quite a few questions from one person, but I think we focused <laughs> a lot on, you know, like basically the basic, you know, the, the basic idea of don't poke your ears. And that is true, right? We, we, we don't want, uh, we protect our hearing so that um, if a sound is too strong, it becomes like a shockwave, it becomes like a punch into the eardrum, which is very sensitive. Um, mm -hmm. we, don't, we talked about why you shouldn't stick a Q-tip or other things into your ear canal because you, it's hard to tell, you know, if you're going to, um, you know, shove stuff in there or accidentally poke it. And the eardrum can heal, but there are so many different stops along the way between there and the brain that, that are also very fragile, right? Right behind the eardrum, there's three tiny bones, the three smallest bones in your body. And what they do essentially is amplify these very tiny vibrations in the eardrum. So if you break those or break the connections between them, then, you, then you'll have a much harder time, um, you know, hearing, understanding these kinds of sounds. Um, then the thing that I was calling the, the snail looking thing, the, the coiled organ there, the, the cochlea, um, that is also, you know, that's an organ like any other and you can, um, you know, you can get ear infections that damage the connections between those or that, that inflame the tissue there. Uh, and then the translation, right? That's where the actual vibration that the eardrum and the bones are kind of in, transmitting, that's where they actually get mm -hmm. 
tr translated. I said translate up here. Um, the word that we use is transduction. So it stops mm -hmm. being a vibration in the air or in the bones, and it starts being a brain signal. Uh, so little uh, chemical signals that our, our cells send to the uh, to the brain. So that process, um, you know, if, if you are in a loud environment your whole life or over a long time, um, this is mm -hmm. also something that that can uh, really uh, that can wear down those connections. And this is what, you know, that's a very, it's an amazing mechanism and it's quite fragile. And I think it evolved in a world that is generally much quieter than the one we live in now. So, you know, it's something that it's, it's kind of like you have a little uh, postage scale or like a kitchen scale and you're, you know, that's what it was designed for. And then you're, you're deciding like, well, I guess I'll use that to weigh myself too. It might work, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not quite, meant for that. It's, you're going to max it out pretty soon. And this is one reason that as we, as we age, we just, you know, we wear down. Um, and as we age, we have a harder time hearing. Uh, so, you know, that's also why we want everyone to wear ear protection when you go do anything loud, um, when you go to a show or, or work with tools or work around um, loud sounds, cars, airplanes, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then the, so the, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I think you're getting to it right now, so I'm going to let you finish. <laughs> yes, um, and then and then of course we get to what what Audrey was mentioning the you know the brain itself, and the brain itself is not one thing; it's many things. Uh, but we'll just mention the cortex, which is kind of this uh, the wrinkly part right here, and of course that that is that's the last of many stops to get there, but it's the beginning of this whole other complicated process. So the, the there's this long chain, and all parts of it are you know, are fragile. So you can have perfectly good hearing in the auditory sense, right? I mean, in the, uh, what we call the peripheral, in the periphery, meaning just all the, the hardware, the ears, the nerves, all that stuff is fine. And then if the brain has either, you know, some disorder from inflammation or injury, or you had a stroke or something like that, or um, any kind of sort of, uh, like brain any problem injury, that's, yeah, yeah. That, that's more internal mm -hmm. rather than uh, external, mm -hmm. uh, then you, you have trouble working with the sound that, come, that comes in, with the sound signals that come in. And this is something that is, uh, you know, that we have a harder time um, treating. In, one partic in some particular cases, we, you can have something called cortical, so just having to do with the, the cortex, cortical deafness. And that means that, mm -hmm. that your ears, like, like I said, are working fine, but the brain can't really pick up any of those signals. And this is one of those cases where over some decades of research, you know, people can have um, cochlear implants, right? Uh, or excuse me. Um, so let me walk that back a second. So if the snail looking thing, right, the cochlea right behind the ear is damaged, we can actually, we have little devices that can more or less do that job. But mm. um, that's, you know, that's a cochlear implant, right? Co an implant that replaces the cochlear function. But if the, the brain is damaged, this is a much harder thing, right? Cortical mm -hmm. deafness is when you are deaf, not because the ears are, uh, are disordered, but because the brain is disordered. And this can be deafness, like I mentioned. It can just be that you can hear fine, but you have an, a processing problem. You have, you have trouble uh, hearing many things at the same time. We'll actually get into that in a second. Um, that, that's, that's a hard thing to do that we mostly don't think about. Um, mm -hmm. and, or you can have something all that stuff can be fine, but then you know you may have high level problems, which means that, like you may have um, attention uh, difficulties or memory difficulties. And of course, when you hear a familiar voice, memory is part of that, right? It's different from a new person's voice. So, mm -hmm. so there are many processes, and um, any damage or disorder to any one of them can can affect your hearing, and uh, you know what we call hearing, right? So hearing okay. is not one thing; it's many things. Okay, so quickly before we move forward, um, we have a second question and we can maybe answer part of it right now. And if, if um, uh, we want to move forward, we can continue answering it at the end. So one person asked specifically, I guess, from the video that you had showed us, um, is there some left right asymmetry in the brain activation um, for that video or I guess Oh, in yeah. great, great auditory question. processing in general, yeah. yeah. Um, so in in this particular analysis, we it, it, it covers a whole range of different types of sounds. I think it, it's actually a set of eighty different sounds. So you wouldn't see it too much here. But the answer is 
kind of, yes, in some ways. So um, this, uh, you know, for example, the left hemisphere tends to be more directly involved in language production and comprehension. So production meaning like speaking or writing and comprehension obviously meaning reading or understanding. And this, like I mentioned, this doesn't have to be auditory, it can be, you know, visual. In general, you know, the left hemisphere is a little bit more language specialized. Um, we're still, we scientists are still arguing about exactly what that means. You know, is it actually language or is it something like, does it have to do with the, the, the particular type of signal it is? Um, mm -hmm. Spatial awareness, uh, you know, if, how you localize sounds like, you know, okay, something is ahead of me, far away, behind me, et cetera. That tends to be a little bit more right lateralized lateralized meaning on one side or another. Um, that is not absolute. So I don't want to get, I don't want to sound like I'm saying le a left brain person is good at language and a right brain person is good at space. That both hemispheres do both function, do every function, but there tends to be a little bit of bias in some cases. Mm -hmm. So those are the two examples that come most immediately to mind. Okay, um, awesome. Yeah. Okay, so I think now would be a good time to like go sure. on to that poll that you, you had prepared for us, yeah. Yes, okay, great. <laughs> so um, I'm going to play you something. And speaking of hearing things at the same time, um, Audrey's gonna throw up a poll here. And it is just, I'm gonna, we're, gonna listen to, um, we're gonna listen to some music. I'll play it for about a minute. And, and you tell me how many instruments are in the band. sit here and listen to that all morning um, but uh, I see that about eight of you have answered I think that is about half of us who are here right now now that was a hard one right uh, we know there's a voice we told you to ignore the voice but pick out a few pretty easily the rest is quite a bit harder and let me show you the answer and we'll 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 see how you well, actually let's see uh, Audrey, do you want to see how we how we answered? Is that shared? Yes. So uh, um, the results are already shared. I okay. think majority okay. of people went with three instruments. Yes. Followed by four, then followed by five. And so people, and it's actually a pretty mm -hmm. decent, you know, distribution. Now, I know we're all listening through a Zoom connection, which is not our favorite way to hear music. But um, mm -hmm. so let me show you. This this was the actual video, and now we'll play another. 10 seconds of it or so. And you can kind of see one, two, three. And these guys, very hard to tell apart. Now, this is something that we call auditory scene analysis, a scene just being, you know, a bunch of different sources and we figure out what it is. Now, we are usually pretty good at this. I gave you a, a pretty hard example, but um, you know, if you were in the room, even blindfolded or not looking, you would do a better job of this. And you know, some of you even got it exactly right this time. Um, this is a particular kind of example, but the, oops. so this is, this is something that is kind of an impossible trick and notice that this little cartoon, it's actually from a scientific review. So people, we like this example. It's not just one that we're you know, showing you as a general audience. Um, and 
this is, remember this kind of messy wave is what your, your eardrum gets. And, um, and so to us, in most cases, it's pretty intuitive. We don't think of that hard about doing this. And we illustrate this by giving you that kind of difficult example there, that everyone's getting the same sound, but what we do with it, how we, how we break it apart, when we don't know who, you know, what the components are, that's, it's, when I say it's an impossible trick, this is something, it, it means that we don't have that information and in theory, it could be anything, but we have a little rule book that, that usually gives us the right guess, okay? Um, and this, you know, for, um, I'm not sure who all is in the audience, but this is computationally underdetermined, right? That, that just means that there is no specific answer just from the sound. So our brains have to do some uh, cheat sheet, you know, type guessing, and we have learned how to do that pretty well. Most of the time we get around pretty well. So the question is, what is in that rule book? How do we do that? And this is something that we do not know, right? Um, we want to know what these shortcuts and these best guesses are that the brain uses to mostly successfully figure out what's happening in the sound world around us. And that's what our project and many other you know, people in the field um, are, are after. So for example, let's just look at this again, this complicated sound, who knows what's in there, and we do a pretty good guess most of the time, but there's something else in there, um, and something else I'm gonna add to this, which is that you know, these people are not just in, you know, surrounded by nothing, they are either in a big space, right? Um, now, bear with me on how you know, messy this kind of looks, but you know, we can tell if we're hearing music in a very big echoey space, or if it's sort of in a smaller, you know, intimate venue, like in a pub or a garage or something like that, right? So we know that, and this is not just one other instrument or something that I was not asking you to identify earlier. The cool thing about this is that those are spaces, those are walls. And unlike these musicians, those are silent. And still we can tell where they are. So there's something interesting in sound as well, which is another recap from last time. Silent spaces have sound signatures too, which feels a little bit paradoxical, right? We can identify a silent space by the sound it makes when we put another sound in it. And this is a way to think about it that, you know, one is, feels obvious once you get to it, but it's very important, right, especially in our field, if, if you have trouble seeing, it's very important to understand where you are, whether you're close to bumping into a wall, the sound changes there. Um, if you're trying to, you know, find the bathroom at night without turning on the light, and this kind of thing, right? Um, so that is, that is the context that we're looking for in our experiment. So we are not looking in our experiment for you know three or four or five musicians we're looking for what is that space how does the brain identify that silent space okay and this is this is a kind of uh one of the set of rules and i think let's see do we want to throw this one up here we asked we asked everyone last time and um some of you may remember last time and there's there's no shame in remembering the right answer from last time. And, uh, and there's no shame in guessing if you have forgotten or don't know. <laughs> so just take a moment and, and take your best guess. You know, is this a built-in rule book that the brain has evolved or is this something that is learned from experience? Okay, so, okay, good, good, good similar distribution like last time. And we can, the, the thing is we can think of examples from each one, right? So like um, uh, even newborns, they can orient right away to, um, to a noise. So just knowing what a noise is or, uh, you know, or voices, they seem to be built in as special uh, compared to say, just like some, you know, something falling on the ground. And then things like uh, language or, a very specific kind of sound, of course we have to learn that, right? So if you think about that intuition, then you can maybe recognize that, you know, we kind of gave you a trick question. This is something that we don't have the answer to. 
and are, you know, we're pretty sure, and there's lots of evidence that there is some of each of this, um, some of what people like to call nature and nurture, right? So there's a, a bit of each mixed in, in a lot of our perception. Um, and the, this is part of what we're trying to find out, not just what is the rule book, but do we have to write the rules as we go along or are we kind of born with them, you know, preloaded, so to speak. So let's go back to this space right here. Okay. Um, and I'm going to play a sound for you. Um, it's going to be a bit quiet and I'll tell you what it is in a second. Okay, so this sounded a bit like someone just clapping their hands in, um, you know, in an empty auditorium like this. But the sound you heard was just the, the sound signature of a silent space kind of like pulled out from whatever was causing the echo. So this is kind of a way to hear what a silent space looks like. And I was showing you these sort of these graphs of sounds that, that look like this, these sort of orange smears. Um, let's just say this is what that, what that sound looks like. And this is again what it sounds like. Okay, it's a little bit quiet. And okay, great, fine. So what can we, you know, can we make one that sounds just like it? That makes you think, oh yeah, yeah, that, that's an empty space. Uh, I'm gonna play you one, I'm gonna play you a sound that you're not gonna like. It's gonna be a little louder, a little bit more annoying. So that's a little bit of a spoiler. Here we go. Right. So that was just a burst of static, right? And this is what it looks like. Uh, it's all yellow, so you can see it. Uh, the little intense parts on the the real sound on the left here um, are just all over the place here. But we can just turn the volume down so that they're the same overall volume. We can make them the same exact length, about one or one and a half seconds long. And if that is true, would you would you be like, well, they're they're the same loudness and they're the same length. So yeah, they're pretty much the same. And the answer, of course, is no. This is not. You don't have to do this poll. This is just something like, well, these obviously sound different. And this is an, an easy example of, of a rule, right? Uh, the rule is definitely not, it just has to be the, the same length or it just has to be the same loudness. It has, it's a little bit more subtle. Um, and we can illustrate this by looking at, at these sounds, right? By, um, by seeing, by he, not just hearing how they sound, but by seeing what they look like when we, when we uh, graph the energy. So it's not just any noise. And that, that was the easy example. Um, okay, so here we are again, right? Um, this is, we're, we're back to this general idea that there's sounds in the world and that they give us one combined messy sound and that it's our job to pull them apart. This is just uh, another, uh, just a, just a, a preview. Um, and here is our hypothesis. This is what we think is, is the case. Remember that we also put these people into a space, right? That was what, what we're adding here. Um, and we think the brain does a better job of separating sounds when they are real, whoops, when they are real. So not when we, you just put any, any noise like I just showed you uh, in the background, we don't interpret that as a space. Um, but when, it's, when it sounds like what a real echo sounds like. So let's explain what that means a little bit more. So this is our actual experiment. How can we test this? You know, it sounds nice. That's a sounds like a reasonable hypothesis. Um, but how can we actually go about doing this? And some of you um, uh, did our uh, online experiment. You can still do it. We'll talk about that in a second. But we'll kind of walk you through the the idea behind it. And you know, this is not too much of a spoiler alert. You know, we can do these experiments too. This is not something where knowing the idea ahead of time. Uh, ruins the experiment. We think this is something that, um, that you'll be able to you know, do no matter what. Okay, so how do we test this? You know, when I said, oh, we think the brain, you know, separates sounds better when they're real and not, not these fake noise sounds that, that we pretend are a room. So what, is that, what does that mean exactly? Let's go through an example. Okay. So uh, people who have done the experiment, this will look look and probably sound pretty familiar. The sounds are a little bit different. We're not giving away the actual experiment here. 
of which sound was recorded in a, in a real room. So we are going to play you um, two sounds. And uh, let's see, Audrey, are we throwing up a poll for this? You can do it. Um, yep, just do it. Yeah, OK, great. Okay, so it's an instrument in some kind of space. Different instrument in a different space. So one of these spaces was not real. Obviously, this was way harder than the obvious annoying example that I gave you just now with a, with a static. Yeah, take a guess. And I'll, I'll play it one more time. Here's the next one. All right. And the responses look fairly evenly divided, which is reasonable, right? That one was tough. All right. So let's find the let's find out what the answer is. Okay. And the answer is this one was the real sound. The, the, so this one was the real space. Both the instruments were real, but the space that, that we kind of made them uh, be part of was a real recording here and then a pretty realistic but fake recording in the second room. And about half of you got it right, which is, which is great. I will tell you why that's great um, in a second. So let's try this one more time. Oops, so one more example. So help us, help us out with this one here. Um, remember, the instruments are real. The spaces are either real or fake. So here's, here's the first one. And here's the second one. And uh, let's see, Audrey, do we have a separate poll for that one? Okay, cool. And I'm going to play it one more time. So here's the sound number one. And Here's the second one. So which of these was in the real space? Ah, interesting. Okay, great, great, great. Um, is everyone seeing this, this result here? That um, overwhelmingly now, um, much you know, more of you chose the second sound as the real one. So let's, let's see how this, how this plays out. And the answer is, OK, uh, the group was pretty much right here, right? The, um, the second space was real. And just, just the way that we talk about it, um, or the, the, the way to describe it would be that the first space, it had a weird kind of like reverse echo, right? It kind of uh, started out quiet and went loud. And if you clap your hands in any room, um, it goes the other way around. It starts loud and then fades away. And this is just one of our one of our easier examples here. And the way that we've been, um, and so you can see that, that some of these sounds are easy to tell apart and some of them are hard to tell apart. Uh, great demo, by the way, that everyone performed exactly how we want you to. Um, so this is, this is just a way of thinking about what we heard uh, visually. So what you hear is this. This is the, this is the messy waveform that arrives at, at your ear. And your brain separates it into this plus that. The plus, by the way, uh, for some folks out there, this is really a convolution and not an addition, but just you know, bear with me. Um, but you have the musical instrument here. And I'm not labeling it. This is just sort of a, a cartoon, right? You have the, the instrument here plus the space, right? And sometimes you hear something. And our idea is that when you have a really, you know, wacky, very unrealistic space that, that this sort of separation, understanding that this is true, is much harder for the brain. So our, we, we're interested in figuring out how different do these have to be before um, the brain can't tell them apart from, uh, you know, can't tell real and fake apart. And we're following, you know, we're not the first to do this. We have a, a colleague who was, who was the first to try this out, but um, we're continuing this, this work, actually. Uh, in collaboration with, with them. So this is one of those things where, you know, every scientist's work builds on other scientists' work. 
-hmm. So speaking of which, um, so Audrey, do we have any, uh, do we want to stop here or? Uh, we have some questions, um, but uh, let me see. Okay, maybe we can take like two questions before we move on. Okay, um, okay so someone asked, putting aside listening disorders or physical impairments, why do individuals hear the same sounds differently? Like there are some individual differences sometimes, I guess, in yeah. how someone perceives sound. Yeah. That may be um, a philosophical question, but let's sure. Go ahead, yeah, go ahead, but, or... but yeah, yeah. So, so aside from saying something like, oh, you have an injury and I don't, and that, that's mm -hmm. sort of the easy explanation. Um, if, if we're listening to the same exact physical sound, the vibration, right, that we talked about, um, why, you know, basically, why do why do different people hear the same thing here, but do a different kind of math here? As we as we mentioned, this is actually an impossible problem. This could be you know any old thing. We usually do a decent job, but why do people do slightly different um, separations here? And the most famous recent example is um, at least for s sound nerds who are on the internet. Um, you know, a, a while ago, does anyone remember? hearing a sound that you could either hear as Laurel or Yanny. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I didn't think of this. I should have, th that would have been a great sound to load up here. Mm -hmm. um, but it's one sound, it, it, it sounded kind of funky, uh, but you could, you could listen to it many times and you're, you would flip back and forth. Some people would start with one and then stick to the other and, and you would hear the word Laurel or you would hear the word Yanny, kind of funny sounding, but it, the interpretation is the same. The sound coming at your ears is identical the entire time, right? And the answer in that case is that you tend to, uh, you, you might have, well, there's sort of two kinds of answers. One is that you might have slight differences in sensitivity to lower and higher frequencies. And these um, sort, of you know, sort of cartoon representations down here in these plots is lower frequencies and up here is higher frequencies. Uh, so meaning like lower frequencies and higher frequencies, right? Um, so if you are more sensitive to higher frequencies, then some parts of words have higher frequencies that you might hear more, you know, you might be more sensitive to, and some have lower frequencies that you might be more sensitive to. And the interesting thing, the other kind of explanation is that this is not just a built-in setting, it changes depending on what you hear. So for example, um, you might be trained just by, you know, listening to, um, whatever your personal experiences, you might have slightly tweaked settings to be more sensitive to higher pitched voices or, you know, different specific kinds of patterns that might be something that you build up uh, with language, for example. Um, you know, uh, you might hear a, a different pattern in a, in a word um, depending on, you know, what your, uh, what your language background is. And you might have a bit of the opposite. So if you have just in the last, you know, minutes or even hours before hearing the sound, if you've listened to a lot of high pitched noise, your brain is actually a little less sensitive just for a little bit. It's kind of like, okay, I'm tired of some parts of the sound. Uh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be a little less sensitive to, to it. You can think of it as being a little bit tired of parts of sounds, right? And so what you heard just before Laurel and Yanni might be part of why you hear one or the other. So this is, this, this idea that we have, you know, we can tweak sensitivity based on what our long-term experience is and that we tweak sensitivity in the short term based on what we have just heard. Um, these, these are things that, that uh, might explain why people hear the same physical sound differently in the brain perceptually. Okay, cool. It's an awesome question, by the way. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I just went on forever about it. <laughs> Okay, um, a second question we have is some musicians uh, have perfect pitch. Is perfect pitch yeah. learned or innate? Can adults learn to develop perfect pitch? Oh my goodness, um, this, this is very interesting. Okay, the, the full answer is that I don't know the details. Um, perfect pitch is, some, is also called absolute pitch, meaning that mm -hmm. um, you hear any tune and, uh, you know, and then you just immediately know it's a B or it's an A or you know something like that. Whereas most people have relative pitch, um, that just means you know you hear a note and you might be able to say, oh, okay, the next note should be like boop, 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 right? Uh, so we we all kind of have this. In most of us have this inherent um, uh, sensitivity to the to harmonics, so like you know musical progressions, in some way. 
but some people uh, have absolute or perfect pitch. And that means they just hear any sound, they don't need context, and they can tell exactly what it is. And um, the answer seems to have a lot to do with training. Um, I think that, that it, it seems to be more important to have that training early. So for example, we don't, um, you know, we don't, say, we don't see a, a color, right, orange, and, and say like, ah, okay, I need to see another color to know what I'm looking at. Now, sometimes that does happen. So if there's color people out there, I'm, being, I'm kind of generalizing. But in general, you look at, you look at a color and you, you have an, um, an immediate appreciation for what it is. And as kids, you know, we are taught, okay, you point to something, uh, you know, apple, okay, that's red, this, that's yellow. And so we kind of like learn to associate specific labels with specific perceptual experiences. And there's some evidence that if you have absolute or perfect pitch, you might have grown up in a household that, that focused a lot on that, where you hear uh, the same note over and over, and then they're like, well, yeah, that's a B, you know, that's an A or that's a C, because you have a piano in your house, you know that this key makes a C, you assign that label in your head, that's, you learn what that sound is, and it's the same sound every time. Most of us, uh, you know, like, I am completely untalented musically, um, you know, I gave it a shot, but it was, it was a, it's just terrible. I'll, I'll let other people do it, right? So. Um, so my pitch is at best relative. Uh, the other end of the scale, by the way, people can also have amusia, which is a complete absence of um, understanding these relationships. So the question about training is likely that it's quite difficult, but that, that it's not impossible. It's not like you were born with it or without it. Okay. Well, I heard so, a podcast um, on this last week. Thank goodness mm -hmm. for, you know, for, waiting, <laughs> for this question. So, before we continue, I just wanted to like say that I, I'm going to send a link to everyone. It's sort of like a summary article on a study where they tried to test this in infants. So it may actually depend also like when you're testing people, like if you're testing them in adulthood, the results may be different, like on some people being able to do it and some people not being able to do it. But maybe if you test them in infants when they're really young and everyone sort of still has like a very similar experience, maybe at that point, um, the distribution on who can do it and who can't do it um, may be a little different. So I'm just going to send that. And with on that note, I think we should continue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's not, yeah. there's not too much left. But so we basically we asked a bunch of you and we still want to ask a bunch of you and we're trying it out ourselves. Many, many pairs of sounds, right? And we're like, which one was in a real room and which one is, was in a fake room? And just like you guys did this time, sometimes it was easy to tell and sometimes it was pretty hard. So, you know, we got some comments, you know, like, how can my brain tell the difference? Sometimes both sounded real. Do we get better with practice? Um, this is a good question, by the way. Let's find out. Uh, but this is a graph. Um, don't glaze over just yet. So just, just look at this. So, so what, what is this dashed line? You can ignore most of the stuff here, but, if, but these bars, they just tell, tell us how well we did. Now, most of us, you know, in school, it's like anything less than 90% um, is, you know, oh, oh no, I did something wrong. But this is not the way that we look at this, like you're, you're bad or you're good. So we, uh, but if you have, you know, we, we just want to know how many you got right out of the ones that, that, the, that we gave to you. And so if we gave you two choices every time and you were just completely guessing like a coin flip, then this line, 50% is, is where you would, you would land. And you can kind of see um, that means you can't tell the real from the fake, right? And what that means to us is that the real and the fake are very similar and that that means the fake is very realistic. And so we had some conditions, some of these sounds, uh, they, were, they were what's called ecological, so very realistic. And so this is hard. And um, so, you know, most people, uh, you can kind of see that, 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 that most people here um, did exactly how we thought, pretty much around 50%. Um, and that means the, the hard ones really were harder to tell apart. And then these are the, the easier ones. There's one called time reverse. And that was the example we heard when instead of a, you know, we just made it backwards to sound very weird, like, right? No echo sounds like that. And people almost invariably got it right. You don't have to be perfect. We made these hard enough that you're never perfect um, you know, on any of them most of the time. And then we have some medium ones. And this is a particular kind of like tweak that we made. You know, 
we can we can alter how realistic it is. And so you can see that these are different kinds of um, fake sounds that we gave you. This one is the the most realistic fake sound. It's basically a real uh, a real space. And this one is the the least realistic. It's basically a completely unrealistic space. And you could your brain could tell the difference. And this is a medium one, where notice that. Um, Notice that these faint lines, uh, these faint bars and these medium bars and these darker bars in each case, that's um, younger, older and adult uh, participants. And you can see that everyone did better on the, the easy ones, but on this medium one, you get better as you grow older, right? And we can kind of see that happening here, but, but even kids you know, have this built in. So this is the way that we kind of look at it, that, that the types of sounds matter a lot, but then the age of, um, of the people listening also matters. Uh, ah, yeah, right, so you can see here. So what does this tell us so far? Um, I think that maybe should be a four, sorry. <laughs> this is about music, not counting. So the, the basic idea, and, and we're in the middle of this, so, so we don't wanna be making, we don't wanna be claiming stuff before we know it's true, um, but adults can tell fake sounds from real ones because the brains can detect the differences in sound properties. And that is just a very general way of saying, you know, we're better at telling these, these sounds apart, even when it's kind of subtle. Um, children can do this, but only when they're very different, right, uh, on our easier conditions. So, so you have to get, um, you have to learn some of this stuff, right, with, um, with, with the more, you have to learn some of the more complex stuff before you can do a good job telling the, the spaces apart. And this, this makes sense. This is kind of uh, consistent with what um, you know, other, other scientists have found. And exactly how this happens will, you know, for, we like to just understand what the different functions are that the, that the brain develops over time. And of course, that can help us understand in a way more pinpointed fashion, you know, how someone with hearing problems or uh, you know, might, might be trained or someone um, with a, you know, some injury or, or disease you know, in the brain might actually be um, uh, treated in a, in a more targeted way than just giving them a hearing aid that turns everything up, right? Um, as anyone with a hearing aid can tell you, uh, those are not, it's not perfect. It doesn't solve every problem. So we might be able to improve um, you know, treatments for, uh, or accommodations for, for hearing disabilities. Um, and this is, that's, that's basically what, where we are at the moment. Um, we are still doing this experiment. This is a real study. We wanted to roll it out to you know, uh, people at, at the science festival um, because there's lots of people in one place and it's hard to get to you guys physically right now. Um, and so we still have this uh, perception experiment. We'll just run you through the, the mm -hmm. demo real quick. Um, um, maybe what we'll do is, so you can play the video and I'll try and yeah. go through the demo really quickly because there are some other questions that I want us to be able sure. to get to before yeah. the end. Um, basically, this is just showing you that from the Bay Area uh, Science Fair website, you can actually click on a link that brings you to a project info page for this project, which gives you information about the project, how you can participate. And if you are interested, you click here like in that video. And this brings you to a consenting process. So maybe at that point, you can just really quickly pause it, Santani, yep. just for those who were not here um, on Wednesday, uh, just to tell you guys about what consenting is. Um, so the consenting process is actually a really important part of research. Like as scientists, like we can't just do whatever we want. Like we do have to follow ethical rules. And part of these rules is to make sure that um, our study participants know what you know, the study is about, what, what's gonna happen if they participate. And importantly, know that like their participation is voluntary. So that means like it's totally up to them, like or totally up to you if you want to participate. Um, okay, so we can play it again really quickly. Um, this uh, demonstration video is going to go through it really quickly. Um, but in the consent part, we're also going to ask you things about like your if you have uh, normal vision, normal hearing, um, and your age or your birth date. And like you noticed in uh, the graphs that, um, or the preliminary results that Santani showed, like we're interested in this information just to know the group averages. So we don't, we're not gonna be looking at individual people. We're always gonna be looking at our data in group averages. So for example, if we've tested kids, well, we wanna know, well, what age group would they fall in? Are they 10 to 11 year olds or are they 
um, eight to nine year olds. That's usually the kind of um, how we're going to look at our data. And it's all going to be kept confidential. No one is going to be able to see this information other than Santani and I. Yeah, this um, is never going to be like, mm -hmm. oh, look how Audrey did. She did okay. Yeah, never. Right? That, this, this is never not this allowed. Is never. In <laughs> yeah. fact, the way we store the data, you know, this form is very different from what the actual experiment um, website is, right? So mm -hmm. once you get to this website and the, the, we'll get, you, know, you get the link, uh, you don't even put your name in. You just say like, uh, this is your number. And the mm -hmm. only people who know what, what that number connects to is, is us. Is us. Yeah, exactly. So um, once you submit the form, I, I, like the video kind of showed it quickly, you'll get two emails. One email it, that you'll have will be a copy of the form so you can review it whenever you want. Um, the other email will be the link to the actual online game and your unique participant ID. And you use that participant ID to sort of fill out the information and the task. Um, and this is just an example of the instructions you're going to see. And you guys actually saw an example of a trial earlier yes. today. So I don't, and I then, think we can skip that yeah. for today. And then, yeah. you know, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> there's, there's some other stuff happening. And then this all looks familiar to everyone by now. Um, it is just a, a way that the experiment goes. Um, so so that is that's just an example of what we do at the uh, Eye Research Institute. You can see that sound is especially important if your vision is having trouble, but they work together in, in any case, right? This is one reason that even though we're at an eye research institute, um, we're interested in sound. Um, and, and we have uh, you know, a couple of colleagues, and I think at least one of them is here now, Helen, if you're mm -hmm. out there, hi, uh, you know, who is, uh, who are working on these kinds of, uh, on these kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. um, do, Audrey, do we want to try to catch some questions before we? Uh, yeah, so we had like one uh, question about, excuse me, about um, um, the example, um, sorry, not the example, the preliminary data that you showed. Okay. Um, the person just wanted um, a bit more information about what the medium difficulty was. Um, so obviously for the easy one, we talked about how it was sort of reversed, like the, the timing of um, uh, the, the echo and no echo, I guess, sounds like that. But for the, for the medium one, um, the medium difficulty one, so right. I guess like so I guess what was manipulated. Like that, this yeah. one here. So, what, so in this particular case, um, so, so uh, I'm not seeing exactly who's asking, but in, just in, in this particular case, there is um, the, the sounds have a particular spectrum. And that just means that um, you know, the pattern of how many low frequencies, how many medium frequencies, how many high frequencies. And in the, in the real world, uh, sounds have a, you know, just the physics of, of air and spaces and, and echoes gives, gives that pattern, that spectrum, a pretty specific, uh, essentially the, uh, okay, the spectral distribution has to be roughly Gaussian. And that just means it has a particular pattern. And we mess with that pattern, right? So if we just say, oh, there's, we just sort of stick in way too many low and high frequencies um, than, than would be realistic for a real setting. Sometimes the brain picks that up, sometimes not. And this is one of those like medium difficult things. Um, sometimes we just say every frequency is exactly the same, right? Low, medium, high. That's also not true. For one thing, higher frequencies, they get absorbed by the air faster, right? Uh, so so, so they, they wear down, they wear off more quickly. This is, again, just a, a function of um, uh, acoustic physics in, 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 the, in our environment here. And so if we kind of make a sound be quite unrealistic for most normal environments that, that brains have gotten used to uh, understanding, then, then we think that is kind of like a, a, subtle, a subtlety that you have to detect as you gain more experience with sound. But like, I, you know, like we're saying, this is all a combination of educated guesses from reading what has done, gone before and a very first pass idea of, um, of what's happening right now. This is, not, this is not us pretending we know the answer for mm -hmm. sure. Um, and there are, there are many different types of subtle manipulations like that you can do, mm -hmm. right? The, the easy, crazy, you know, the, the, the easy, very drastic one that you never hear in the real world is the time reverse where, like I said, the, the echo kind of starts out from nothing and goes, um, you know, goes to a, a very loud level. That's just not how sound works. Right? Mm -hmm. Even though okay. overall you get all the same frequencies and the, the same sound, it's just in the wrong order. Mm -hmm. And the brain can tell that very, very easily. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, just, I wanted to add something interesting about this slide, but before that um, we are 1132 now, and I know some people um, have left already. And if you need to go, feel free to go to um, 
other events because I know today is the last day. Um, if you yes. do have a bit more time, though, I think we can we're going to stay for like another two, three minutes to sort yes. to continue talking about about um, this and to answer any other questions that people had. Yeah. Anyone um, who has to take off right now. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming twice. Some of you. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you could just go back to the previous yes. the, the preliminary data slide. Um, like one thing that I thought was um, interesting, or I'm just, okay. So what's cool, I guess, to see, so remember uh, Santani was mentioning that the lighter bars is like younger kids. And then as the bar gets darker, you're basically an adult. But what's actually kind of cool is if you look at the time reverse, like yeah, adults are better than kids at it, but kids can tell the difference. They're not at that, that dash line there, which means that like you're kind of guessing. But if you look at the medium one, not only are like adults better than the kids, the kids are actually really kind of guessing at that point like they can't tell the difference almost yeah. like the green basically like the green one uh, which was like really difficult where it almost sounds exactly the same so i think that that's i mean again this is preliminary data but it's something that's uh kind of cool so it's not just that um the adults are actually just better in this case for for that one yeah so, um, so we know that you get better at everything you know from being a baby to being an adult you get better at almost every type of uh every type of analysis just because babies they're busy learning how to you know uh, poop and feed themselves and stuff like that they're not that interested in in analyzing sound consciously right but um mm -hmm. uh so so the fact that you get better is not that interesting the fact that you get better but already start out good at some and start out you know bad at others that is what we're interested in that those mm -hmm. differences mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. okay so one last uh, question was, someone was mentioning, okay, so I did the experiment a couple of days ago. Uh, hearing you talk about what sounds would be like in a real room might, uh, might be like, help me know what to listen for, at least in general. So I, was, I wasn't really thinking about that, what a real room meant when I did the game. Yeah. If I repeated this experiment, like I wonder if I would do better, same or worse. Yes. So. Okay. Yeah. So, so it, anyone who did the experiment, you, you notice that, even, okay, we're even talking about it now. We didn't do a ton of practice, right? Like we didn't guide you super carefully. We gave you a few practice um, mm -hmm. trials, you know, uh, and mm -hmm. so, okay, this one's right, this one's not, and you get the basic idea. But what we're trying to test is not how well you, it's like, it's not like a quiz where you learn some facts and then we just see how, how well you did. It's more like a quiz of your entire, the life of your brain so far, right? Uh, how, how well do you know this instinctively? And that's why when we play a realistic sound, um, you know, you're drawing on not just what we're asking you to do right now, but the, the experience that you've gathered. Okay, but will you get better at this particular task, this particular, you know, experiment, the way we formulated it, if you practice a lot? Uh, we think the answer is probably yes. Practice is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, is practice makes almost perfect. Um, sometimes practice does not make perfect, by the way. So there, another experiment had, had very, very highly trained subjects, uh, you know, participants, and um, they still could not uh, tell the, the, the difficult the ecological sounds from, from the real ones. They were too close together, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, so the idea is that, you know, you, you may get overall better with practice, but the patterns, the differences between these, we think those are more likely to be uh, maybe not fixed exactly, but more likely to be robust for, for one person. Mm -hmm. But right. it's a good question. Practice will, mm -hmm. will change a lot of things. And that's, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I think maybe we can wrap it up for today. Uh, for those who are yeah. still here, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Um, uh, we're yeah. super happy to have you guys join us today. And we hope that this was fun and interesting. Yes. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email us, whether it's about, I guess, the presentation or about participating in the study, we'd be more than happy to, to answer them. So either a personal email or the email, um, the project email that you'll see on our project page website. Yeah. Okay. And this will be recorded so you can come back and, you know, put it on yeah. repeat if you want. <laughs> questions like this, we, we welcome them. We, we do our best to answer when we're not overwhelmed with other stuff. Um, so, yeah. Thanks again. And... Uh, have a great rest of the fair and your weekend. Yes. Bye, everyone. Bye.